I'm sometimes tempted to wonder what's the point of philosophers. <laughs> and then I remember Dan Dennett. And all is revealed, all is answered. Dan, I, I said that uh, Jerry Coyne was my guru since John Maynard Smith died with respect to evolutionary genetics. Dan Dennett is my guru with respect to clear thinking and whether an argument that I want to put forward works, whether it's, uh, it's silly, whether it's obvious. I would always go to Dan in the way that I used to go to John Maynard Smith uh, as a mentor uh, and as a dear friend. He's one of the participants in the, the Four Horsemen DVD which uh, Josh produced uh, and um, it's a very great pleasure to me to uh, invite him to speak to us today. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the evolution of confusion. And since this is Darwin year, I, I, I do have to acknowledge at the start that, that there's pretty obvious why I get invited to give Darwin talks. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I, I seem to be getting to look more and more like him as time goes by. He is my hero, so uh, uh, a nice person to look like. Uh, but in any case, uh, what I'm going to talk today about is uh, complexity in religion and design in religion. And earlier today, or no, yesterday, we heard P.Z. Myers talk about uh, complexity in design. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at a couple of interesting examples. What do we see here? We see two remarkably similar uh, uh, configurations. Uh, there's dark, dark rocks at the center of a ring of lighter colored rocks, all of about the same size. And one of them is uh, an example of design, intelligent design, and one of them isn't. Uh, you may already know the answers to them, but I'll just tell you what they are. The one on the left was an Andy Goldsworthy sculpture, and the one on the right was a patterned uh, ground created by self-organizing freeze and thaw patterns in the Arctic. This was a, a, actually a cover story in Science back in 2003. Now, if you want to know how those are made, you have to sort of reverse engineer them. In both cases, there's a process. In one case, there is a uh, a, a plan, a, a, an organized, represented plan. In the other case, absolutely not. It's just a physical process and doesn't involve any life at all. And in fact, uh, the, uh, we look, here's a few more examples. Uh, uh, you might want to guess which of these are, are designed and, and which not. Uh, the one on the uh, upper left and lower right are both not designed. Those are both... Uh, formed just by natural uh, tidal actions on uh, certain sorts of coastal waters. And the other two are designed, and again, we have an Andy Goldsworthy sculpture on the upper right. If you don't know his work, I highly recommend it. It's beautiful. And we can reverse engineer the, the rock system, and, and there's even a computer simulation that was done which showed how those rocks came to take on the remarkable pattern that they did. So uh, what I want to do today, though, is talk about reverse engineering religion. Now, when you reverse engineer anything, you want to know how it works, uh, what it does and how it does what it does. And one way to figure out how it works is to see if you can get it not to work, see if you can break it or induce pathology in it, and then learn something about how it works from how it fails to work when you can induce pathology. This is a well-established methodology in, uh, across science, in fact, and in particular in the area that I have spent uh, really most of my sort of scientific research time, and that is in uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience, cognitive science, where we often use experiments of nature where we have human beings who have suffered in one way or another, they've suffered brain damage or they've been subjected to one 
horrible uh, or very unusual regime or another, or it may just be sitting in a, some psychologist's lab and having various things flashed at them for a while, and then you learn something about how the machinery works by seeing what kind of pathology or failure you can induce in the system. In fact, if you couldn't do that, you'd be hard-pressed to, uh, to distinguish what you see from just, just uh, magic or something. It's, we, we have to understand how these things work. So now, what are the pathologies of today's religions? Um, well, how about preachers who are atheists? That would seem to be a fairly pathological uh, state of affairs for a religion to have atheist preachers. Um, and of course, there's lots of former preachers who are atheists. In fact, there's some in this room. Uh, and those in this room who would like to talk to me afterwards about their own experiences, I'd be, be very pleased to add you to our, our database. But we're mainly interested in preachers who are still in the pulpit, who still have parishes, who are still preaching. Uh, and so we're looking at closeted, non-believing atheists, uh, clergy who are, you know, closeted, non-believing clergy. And we have found, for this pilot study, six volunteers. They're between the ages of 37 and 72. Just one woman, five men. For ease of exposition, I'll say there's three liberals and three literals. That is to say, the literals came from quite conservative religious backgrounds where they tended to be literalist about the reading of the Bible. And the three liberals came from uh, liberal churches where uh, uh, the, uh, the wiggle room in understanding scripture was already established in their childhood. So we have a Presbyterian and Episcopalian and a United Church of Christ for the liberals, a Methodist, a Baptist, and a Church of Christ for the, for the, for the liberals. Now we haven't yet found a good Mormon or a Roman Catholic, but uh, that may be phase two. Uh, we're pretty sure they're out there if they'd be willing to participate. These are, needless to say, deeply confidential, entirely uh, 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 secure, but in-depth interviews, three long interviews uh, by a very experienced interviewer, Linda Lascola, who's a uh, psychiatric social worker with many years of experience uh, as a professional interviewer and qualitative researcher. By the way, it's particularly fitting I tell you a bit about this here, because uh, she sent me an e email uh, a little bit more than two years ago about this, and uh, we met at the uh, AAI conference in Washington, where we uh, uh, agreed to join forces on this project. So it's thanks to the AAI that this thing never happened at all. Now, uh, what are the questions that need answering? One of them is why there are atheist clergy at all? Uh, how does this come about? You might think that's very strange that an institution like a church should end up with uh, uh, among the professionals in the official pay of the church would be people who were uh, atheists. Uh, uh, and yet, the reasons why there are atheist clergy are not so hard to find. Uh, we might call it the not-so-tender trap. First, I'm going to describe the trap, and then the, the more, more curious question is, how, why does the trap exist? But what's the trap? Well, uh, you're a clergyman, and you lose your faith, and you contemplate leaving the church, and it is a vertiginous, nauseating, scary prospect. Uh, as they say, what about my mortgage? What about my wife and kids? What about the financial bind I've been? If I walk away from this job, I have no security. I don't have any training for any other job. Uh, so some of them are really locked in by financial considerations, uh, and I'm sure we can all sympathize with that sort of predicament. Um, also, as I just mentioned, lost opportunities for training. This is all they know how to do. How are they going to make a living? How are they going to support their wives and families? 
or their husbands if they, uh, if they come out as atheists. Uh, then, of course, there's the Concord fallacy. It is extraordinarily difficult to say, it's not so hard to say to yourself, interestingly enough, but it is very hard to say to the rest of the world, oh my, I have wasted the last 40 years of my life. Uh, it takes a very strong person, I think, to announce that to the world. But I think, in fact, there is, in a way, a more heartening reason why these people stay in the ministry. It's because they are basically very good people, and they're trapped, and they don't want to hurt people, and there are a lot of people for them to hurt. Their families, their friends, their associates. Uh, here's a quotation from one of them. There have been times when I'd say, you know what, I'm just going to tell everybody and whatever happens, happens. And then I think, gosh, I can't do that. I, I think I could handle it, but it's other people that I'm worried about. Or one man talking about his wife, and he's saying, it's just going to turn her life upside down. So these are people caught in an excruciatingly tight trap and dealing with it one way or another. Now, in the case of our small self-selected sample, my own guess is that at least half of them will soon take a deep breath and take the plunge and, and go public and uh, let the chips fall where they may. But at least two of them are in it for the duration, and profess to be content and happy. And they have, their, they have their reasons, they have their, you might say they're their rationalizations, or you might say, no, given their current predicament, this is the morally right thing for them to do, and they are right to do it. They do more good and less harm if they stay and, in effect, sacrifice their own integrity and their own honesty, uh, and live out a lie rather than reap the consequences of revealing the truth. There are six very different cases, and uh, they're really quite moving when you read these interviews. And may I say, uh, Linda Lascola is one heck of a good interviewer. I read the transcripts, and I think, boy, oh boy, <laughs> I couldn't have given this good, an I couldn't have conducted this good an interview, not by a mile. She's extremely good at uh, uh, securing and deserving to secure the confidence of the interviewees and then probing gently but very firmly probing, probing, probing. By the way, if you haven't seen it, another nice example of the same sort of thing is the, is the television episode where Richard uh, interviewed uh, uh, Father George Coyne and very respectfully held his feet to the fire. And you watch this really very intelligent and lovely man, uh, George Coyne, the, the, the uh, Roman Catholic priest, who's also this, the royal, well, not the royal astronomer, but the Vatican, was the Vatican astronomer. And to watch him tie himself in knots, trying to deal with the conflicts between his church and his science, is a, it's a stunning uh, example. Uh, I have to say that our six... Uh, ministers are not in the same intellectual league as George Coyne. They are they're good people, but they're not very good thinkers. Uh, but sometimes you learn a lot from people who are not that good thinkers uh, because you see what they rely on, how they think about these things. Um, it's interesting that some of them are... Uh, quite bookish, a few of them. I'm sure Christopher Hitchens will be delighted to learn that it was reading God is Not Great, which was the tipping point for one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would surprise a lot of people, but no, that's, that was it. That's what did the job in one case. 
And uh, the God Delusion was also on the reading list of uh, at least half of them. Uh, uh, so that uh, uh, um, our books are getting through, even to the clergy. Uh, well, how did they get in this pickle? First of all, they all think that they are the tip of the iceberg. They all think that there are lots and lots of closeted atheist clergy, but they don't know. One of the most interesting things about them is that although they have this conviction, they have no way of testing it that they dare do. They're scared to raise the issue even with their closest friends in, in the clergy. And again and again, when you probe them on their lives, it is just wonderfully or eerily or sadly reminiscent of the plight of homosexuals back in the 50s. They don't have any gaydar. <laughs> or they don't trust their gaydar. And they're terribly afraid of coming out to the wrong person. And so they adopt all the usual circumlocutions, and it's these wonderful cases of sort of plausible deniability. Uh, they'll get together and they'll say, um, you know my uncle, I got an uncle who thinks, da -da 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 -da. what do you think of that? <laughs> well, they're talking about themselves, but and probably, probably the person they're talking to knows that. And they go on with a discussion like this. And it's all veiled, so there's always deniability. It's always uh, uh, no mutual knowledge there. Uh, and that's in itself a very interesting thing. But how did they get into this pickle? Well, it turns out that they have a lot in common, even though, as I say, they're, they come from quite different backgrounds. And how did the trap come to exist? Well, let's talk about how they got in the pickle in the first place. It all goes back to seminary. When they go to seminary, they basically are initiated into a secret brotherhood, sisterhood, fatherhood, a secret society. And it doesn't make much difference whether the seminary is conservative or liberal. What happens is that these are young people, you may know some, idealistic young people. They've been raised in a church. They've been going to church all their lives, and they've decided the life of the church is for them. They, they study religion maybe in college, and then they go to seminary. And, or maybe they go straight to seminary without, without doing uh, a, a college. But what they find at the seminary as one person said, oh, you can't go through seminary and come out believing in God. Uh, now that's almost surely uh, a, a bit of bravado, a bit of uh, exaggeration. But the point that he was making is really quite striking. Um, everywhere you go to seminary, you have Bible studies. And this is the history of biblical scholarship, its textual criticism. And they learn about how the various texts were written, when they were written, how we know they were written, and um, what happened next, and which borrowed from which. And they get a pretty good dose of textual criticism on how the Bible was compiled, and how uh, various texts got included, and by after sort of political arm wrestling of various sorts, other texts got excluded. And so they learn about how the Bible was put together. That's not what they learned in Sunday school. And their response to that is striking. The literals, many of them, are angry. They, they get very confrontational with the professors, and they refuse to accept what they're being taught in class. They want, uh, they realize that if they want to get a good grade and the passing grade in that class, they're going to have to spew back this terrible stuff. They are not convinced by it at all, whereas many are convinced, 
or at least bothered. And in any case, the cat is out of the bag. They get an introduction to the, what's known by scholars about the recension of the texts. Now, in itself, I think this is a very interesting and, in fact, very hopeful sign. Because even in conservative seminaries, even, for instance, in Baptist seminaries, you get that scholarship. You apparently, it's very hard to find anybody who will be a professor of Bible studies and not tell the truth. And so the love of scholarship, the respect for evidence, is playing a subversive role right at the heart of the training program of young clergy. Now, this is not news to people in religion. There are several books which recount this in great detail. Uh, uh, Bart Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus, is a very good example. He is a very distinguished biblical scholar. And he started out at the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which is one of the most conservative in the country, where the professors had to take an oath. They had to sign a statement that they believed that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. But still, they taught the history of the, of the recension of the texts. And this bothered young Ehrman, because he couldn't put this together with uh, how could... Well, if it is the inerrant word of God, then it's really, really important that we figure out what the, which, which of these many versions is God's version, because it's the only one that's inerrant. And he found that his professors were not all that interested in that question. They sort of abandoned the idea that there was uh, uh, one version, which was the inerrant word of God, even though they'd signed on to that. So that began uh, 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 Bart Ehrman's uh, Life. I guess he was ordained at one point, but he's a professor of, of uh, biblical studies now, a very good scholar, uh, uh, one of the leading scholars in the field. And this is a book about uh, how this uh, politically and, and in the scholarly and political history of this, of this development. Uh, uh, another book which is often mentioned in the same regard is Jack Good's book, The Dishonest Church. Now, Good is a uh, former minister who is really outraged by, this, by, the, by the chasm between the laity and the clergy, where the clergy, they all know these secrets, and they, it's a conspiracy to keep the secrets from the parishioners who can't handle that kind of information. Now, a lot of young people get to seminary, they confront this, they get outraged, and they walk away, and lucky them, they made a very, they dodged a bullet. Because they got out while the getting was good. Others, and I wonder if you reflect on yourself, I, when I look at their lives, and think, well, what would I have done at that point if I'd made that investment in going to the seminary? Would I have hung around? Would I have thought, well, let's see, maybe we'll see, and see if I get ordained, and... Uh, the, uh, the temptations to stay with the program along the way are surely great. And after all, these people go in with, with really pure intentions. They, they want to help the world. They want to help the world by doing what their, everything in their childhood said, this is the way you do good. There's hardly a better way of doing good than this. And then they get to seminary and they discover that. Of course, a skill that is taught in seminary is how to put a spin on the truth about the Bible. Now, it's, there isn't a course called How to Put a Spin, <laughs> needless to say. No, it's taught by example, sort of in every class. They learn from their professors about how clever ways of talking can glide you over these problems and provide you with things that you can say to the parishioners that are, if you squint just right and get the light just right, they're sort of the truth about what you know. <laughs> How to avoid divulging the truth about the Bible. 
This is what they learn. Well, at this point, I begin reflecting on a question that I'd asked myself in the past. Why does theology exist? I mean, why? Uh, why are there people who devote their lives to being theologians? It's, uh, it's sort of like string theorists. You think, yeah, you know. <laughs> Is it... And you, for years, I think, I thought it was just sort of just, a, just a, a, an excrescence, a byproduct of the way uh, uh, cultures treat religions. And you think that over the, over the centuries, uh, there's always going to be some curious and pretty smart people who just can't quite get their head around the standard stuff that they hear from the pulpit. And they don't want to abandon it, so they cast about for presentable ways of recasting that material in terms that they can be intellectually comfortable with. And since they're very clever, they come up with all sorts of interesting stuff. And if they're really, really, really clever, they may even end up inventing modal logic or uh, coming up with some, some important advances in philosophy simply in the course of their campaign to figure out some way of couching what they uh, believe they ought to believe and profess in terms that they that satisfy their 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 sense of intellectual integrity. So I thought that it was a sort of um, encapsulated uh, scholarly, uh, uh, you know, taking in each other's laundry, and it, to some degree, I think that is what it is. And heaven knows the academy is full of pockets of very clever people doing stuff very well where you wonder why on earth are they doing it. I, I like to quote Donald Hebb, one of my heroes, the, the, the great Canadian psychologist who once said, if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. <laughs> you think about it and you think what what decimation this would do to academics if we if we applied it rigorously. There's a lot of people out there doing very well, very, very well, very professionally, things that probably aren't worth doing. And I thought that theology was one of those, but I've come to realize that it does actually have some users. There are some people who avail themselves of the work of the theologians. And who are they? They're the ministers who have to have an answer to what can I say to the parishioners? And so they're actually quite eager to read the latest theology, give them, and theology, of course, changes as times change because parishioners have different issues and problems and questions. And so there's always, apparently, a market among some clergy for new ways of responding to those embarrassing questions that they get from parishioners, and that's fed by the theologians. Now, some of the theologians, of course, go too far. You have people like Bishop Spong and Don Cupid, who are uh, as close to being uh, explicit atheists as you could get and are derided and reviled as atheists by many, uh, uh, by many Christian uh, uh, leaders, uh, uh, but just as much honored by others for their uh, liberating and, and refreshing and and wonderfully insightful views on, on the nature of religion. Um, in other words, what I'm saying is that what theology is, is a compilation of ways of not coming clean about the whole enterprise. Or, as you might say, theologians are religion spinmeisters. That, I think, is that's what theology is today, and I see no reason to believe it isn't what it's always been. I see that as its raison d'etre. Now, let's consider the canons of good spin. It is not a barefaced lie. You have to be able to say it with a straight face. <laughs> Very important. It has to relieve skepticism without arousing curiosity. <laughs> oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. Oh, well. 
All right. And it should seem profound. Now, uh, uh, you've been introduced to some new terms. Uh, oh, it's Kipple was one, and uh, um, Granfaloon was the other. Yeah. Well, I want to introduce a term of my own that I coined some years ago, and that's deepities. <laughs> now, I didn't invent the word itself. The daughter, the teenage daughter of a colleague of mine did. He came in to see me one day, and he said, well, last night at supper, around the dinner table, I was holding forth on, I can't remember what the topic was, but, but I said something that I thought was rather important and, and, and profound, and, and my daughter, Alex, said, ooh, dad said a deepity. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since he told me that story, I thought, oh, man, deepities, I like that idea. Yeah, dad said a deepity. Uh, so what's a deepity? I've taken it beyond the, just the term itself, and I've given it a definition. So a deepity is a proposition that seems to be profound because it's actually logically ill-formed. <laughs> it has at least two readings and balances precariously between them. On one reading, it's true, but trivial. On the other reading, it's false, but would be earth-shaking if true. And so what happens is, you hear it, and you think, oh, yeah, this seems true. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. And then you got yourself a deepity. So I want to, I, to help you get on with the term, I want to give you an example of a deepity. Are you ready? This is going to be pretty profound. <laughs> Everybody's sitting. That's good. That's good. Love is just a word. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Love is just a word. Now, let's just walk through it. Here's the first reading. Love is just a word. That's true. It's trivial. It's a word. It begins with an L. It's got four letters. It's comparable to Cow is just a word, and cheeseburger is just a word, and so forth, for any word you like. So there's the true trivial reading of the sentence. And here's the other one, which is, just take those quotation marks off, love is just a word. Oh, really? Oh, my. Um, first of all, it's false. I mean, whatever love is, it isn't a word. It may be an interpersonal relationship. It may be a, a, an emotion. It may be the most wonderful uh, phenomenon in, in human psychology. Or it may be an illusion. But it isn't a word. It is not a word. You can't find love in the dictionary. Right? That's almost a deepity. <laughs> Or maybe that would be a good country western song. You know? <laughs> uh, uh. So, um, what these are, and this is one of the common forms of DP, it's a, really an elementary mistake. I, I catch my students in their essays doing it all the time. We have a name for it, it's called a use mention error. It's confusing the use of the word with the mentioning of the word. That's why we philosophers get really nitpicky about saying, you've got to put quotation marks around words like that, right? because otherwise you have an ill-formed sentence. If you want to talk about the word love, put it in quotes, because you're mentioning the word, not using it. Okay? That's a use mention error. It is such a common mistake, such an elementary mistake, that I, U-M-E, I write it in the margin, you know? U-M-E, use mention error. So this is not, as it were, sophisticated stuff. This is a very common mistake. Now, Richard, every now and then, asks me, well, what's the point of philosophy, or why are there philosophers? Yeah. So here is another example of some philosophers at work. Okay. Gottlob Frege, one of the great uh, fathers of modern logic, famously 
and notoriously and perplexingly said, the concept horse is not a concept. This is paradoxical. Now, what he meant by that, if you're interested, and there's no particular reason to be interested, but what he meant by that is that given his theory of concepts, only predicates are really the names of concepts, and the concept horse is, of course, a subject. And so that's not going to be a concept. Is a horse, on the other hand, is a horse, that is a concept. Well, philosophers don't agree about Frege, about whether Frege is right about the concept horse is not a concept. There's a lot of literature debating that. But what every philosopher, I think, agrees on is that the concept horse is not a horse. <laughs> you know, you can't ride it, it doesn't have to be fed hay. It's a concept. Now, if you make the mistake of thinking that the concept horse is a horse, then you're making a sort of use mention error uh, with concepts instead of words as the problem. So, so there's a kind of use mention error here. And this use mention error is actually very common in theology. We see it all the time. Now here's Karen Armstrong. She wrote a book back in 1993 called A History of God. A History of God. Compare it with A History of the Easter Bunny or A History of Superman. Now, what she's really talking about, of course, is the history of the concept of God or the history of the concept of the Easter Bunny. The concept of the Easter Bunny changes over the years, but in case you didn't know it, there is no Easter Bunny. So, there, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to shatter your illusions, but there is the concept of the Easter Bunny. How many of you believe in the Easter Bunny? Oh, how many of you believe in the concept of the Easter Bunny? We all do, yeah. Atheists believe in the concept of the Easter Bunny. And we can believe in the concept of Superman without believing in Superman. And yet this confusion between the concept and the thing it's a concept of is uh, very creatively used by many people in, in theology. Robert Wright just published a book called The Evolution of God. The whole book is one long attempt to sort of fog over the fact that all he could really be talking about at best is the evolution of the concept of God but he wants to sort of sneak it in so that you think he's actually talking about the evolution of God, not the evolution of the concept of God. If he'd written a book called The Evolution of the Concept of God, first of all, a lot of people would have sort of yawned. They'd say, yeah, yeah, there's quite a history there. And it would be like the evolution of the concept of the Easter Bunny. It, it would not imply anything about whether God was real, but just whether the concept was real. And we all, how many of us believe in the concept of God? Yeah, right. In other words, the whole book is a one big use mention error. <laughs> Rodney Stark, One True God, Historical Consequences of Monotheism, is a similar book. Here's what he says. All of the great monotheisms propose that their God works through history. I plan to show that at least sociologically, they're quite right. God works through history. Sociologically, they are quite right. That a great deal of history triumphs as well as disasters has been made on behalf of one true God. What could be more obvious? Yeah, the whole thing is, is, a, is a use mention error. Um, uh, here's, here's one of our, one of our interviewers. <laughs> God is literally what we would call a metaphor. Oh, well, I don't know about you, but, you know, I believe in metaphors. <laughs> so I guess I can say I believe in God. Huh. If God's a metaphor, hey, that's easy. Or this is a different, different, a different dodge, but 
You, you'll recognize it. When I lived in New Mexico, I heard these Native American storytellers tell creation stories or other stories about their tribe. Then they'd say, maybe it didn't happen this way, but the story's true. Meaning there's truths in the story, but they're not literally true. This, of course, is a very well-known uh, turn of phrase in many versions. It spreads uh, effortlessly. It seems to be, uh, I guess it's what I would call a good trick. It's discovered again and again and again. Uh, you don't even have to copy it from others. It's such an obvious move to make when you're pressed with an awkward question. Here's another quote from uh, one of our uh, uh, interviewees. I define God as the process of creativity within evolution and human history that makes for greater humanization. This is clearly one of our liberals. Now, I think about this, I think, oh, well, if that's how God is defined, I think I believe in God. I think Richard probably believes in God. If what it is is the process of creativity within evolution and human history that makes for greater humanization, well, I guess so. So if that's what God is, then that's another way of saying that you believe in God. And then Rodney Stark again. I do not... Rodney Stark is an interesting person because he's a very clever man, writes, uh, he's really a sociologist, writing about religion. He clearly likes religions that are, he wants an anthropomorphic God. He thinks a God that you can't make bargains with, that you can't pray to, that you can't uh, uh, make promises to and expect returns from. He has a sort of economic theory about this. It's an agent you can bargain with. And if that's not your God, then he's just not interested. It's not, not a God for him. I do not mean to suggest that this portrait of God is the product of conscious human creation. No one sat down and decided, let's believe in a supreme God, surround him, her, with some subordinate beings, postulate an inferior evil being on whom we can blame evil. Rather, this view tends to evolve over time because it's the most reasonable and satisfying conclusion from the available religious culture. Well, now, as you read this, this does seem to be a sociologist talking about the evolution of concepts, about cultural evolution, about the sort of mimetic trans, uh, uh, transmission of these ideas. Then he puts a wonderful footnote on it. Nor am I prepared to deny that this evolution reflects progressive human discovery of the truth. In other words, in case you wondered, I'm not saying it's all just made up, it's all just a fiction. It might for all we know, be getting, like science, getting closer and closer to the truth. Even though he's just described it as a process which would not, unlike science, have any reason for us to suppose it was the sort of process that would tend to get us to the truth rather than to a, to a particularly satisfying falsehood. Now, back briefly to Karen Armstrong. On Fresh Air a week ago, she said, God is no being at all. Now, this is interesting. Compare one with two. No being at all is God. Now, one is sophisticated theology. Two is crude atheism. She's really down on crude atheism. Trouble is they're logically equivalent. If you put them into the predicate calculus, they come out with exactly the same formula. So they mean the same thing. But one of them is sophisticated, and one of them is that crude, primitive atheism that the four horsemen represent. And at this point, I think you can begin to see, I'm beginning to see more and more what I'm going to call the transparency of theology. That is, when you look at how it's conducted and how it, it's just so obvious it's like a magician doing a trick where you can see the card up his sleeve it's just not it's just and, and I was thinking about this I was talking with Richard last night and it reminds me some of you will know this and some of you won't how many of you remember John Lovitz and the uh, compulsive liar Ah, yes. So I'm going to do my John Lovitz-inspired... This is... Here's Karen Armstrong. 
uh, through the eyes of John Lovitz. <laughs> Terry Gross says, well now, Karen, do you believe that God exists? Oh, now I think that's the wrong question. <laughs> I really think, because you see, um, uh, that supposes that God is a being that might exist or not. But God is no being at all. No, God is no being at all. In fact, God is being itself. Yeah, that's the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Moreover, God is being as no even more. God is the God beyond God. <laughs> it rings off the tongue so nicely. And you can see that this is what theologians theologians are doing. Now, having encountered this uh, with Armstrong, Richard reminded me that he'd already, he'd already exposed her uh, in a response to Karen Armstrong in The Guardian about a week or two ago. If sophisticated theologians or postmodern relativists think they're rescuing God from the redundancy scrap heap by downplaying the importance of existence, they should think again. Tell the congregation of a church or mosque that existence is too vulgar an attribute to fasten onto their God, and they will brand you an atheist. They'll be right. <laughs> I love this quote. God is so great that the greatness precludes existence. Now that's really deep. Now that's... You know, and what I particularly love it, about it is that this was said by Raimondo Panikar in 1989. And some years earlier, the wonderful novelist Peter de Vries parodied this very idea in a, in a hilarious book called The Mackerel Plaza. It's a novel, one of his funniest. Uh, de Vries is an interesting man. Like Stark, he likes his religion anthropomorphic and bold and conservative, and he hated liberal, uh, sort of suburban liberal Protestantism. He really didn't like that. And so he wrote a novel which has a character, Reverend Mackerel, who is the epitome of suburban liberal uh, 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 preacher. And there's a hilarious sermon, and the punchline of Mackerel's sermon is it's one of my favorite lines of all times. And so, dearly beloved, it is the final proof of God's omnipotence that he need not exist in order to save us. <laughs> yeah. Now, <sighs> Richard, Richard was asking me the other day, uh, he and Christopher and Sam, less me, but I get a little of it, are often accused of being uh, philosophical Philistines, crude, untutored uh, people who shouldn't mess with sophisticated complexities in the field of philosophy. And he wanted to know, did I think that it was true, and that, what, what philosophy should he read if, if, if he should repair this damage? I said, no, I just don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. I think that theology, and particularly philosophical theology, is... Uh, a pseudo-sophisticated mug's game, and there's no reason to learn any of it uh, because uh, we've just seen some of the best of it, and it's full of, of uh, uh, I think, willful obscurity and uh, willful use of uh, uh, deepities. Uh, <laughs> um, so instead, what we should think about is the evolution of the God meme, and here... This is, in a way, a partly a response to something that PZ was talking about yesterday. Um, the trap that traps these poor people in the role of closeted, non-believing clergy is cunningly designed to hold them. It is, it is a well-designed trap, but nobody designed it. There's no mastermind. There's no ringleader. There may be individuals who have a very good idea about it and who want for their own reasons to perpetuate it, but that's not necessary. I think every detail of that institution, of that 
set of circumstances could arise by nothing other than natural selection, blind variation and selection, where these are such potent features of the institution that they get prolonged and prolonged uh, and become self-perpetuating in spite of the fact that uh, uh, n nobody really has to be their, um, uh, their shepherd, their, their, their uh, steward. They take care of themselves quite brilliantly over time. Uh, in the paper that, that uh, Linda Lascola and I are going to write, we're going to look at that claim in more detail. <coughs> What we have here, as so often in biology, is reasons without a reasoner. There's lots of reasons why biological structures take on the shapes they do, and why, why uh, bones are the way they are, and wings, and eyes, and brains, and, and, and uh, proteins. Uh, why they, there's lots of answers to a lot of why questions. And there's the reasons that we invoke are reasons that are not represented in the mind of God, nor are they represented anywhere until they're represented by the biologists that figure them out. What they do is they shed light on the processes, the blind, re unreasoning processes, which have gradually honed in on those reasons, because by default, this is what, this is what Darwin realized, that when you have offspring, some will die and some will live. Some will die for no reason, some will live for no reason, but some, there will be a reason why they did better than the others. Those reasons tend to be perpetuated and honed, honed and sharpened and built upon, and in that way, the process of natural selection gradually identifies and in, in effect endorses reasons. That's reasons without a reasoner. Now, when I talk this way, I recently have discovered a new term for this. It's called adaptationist paranoia. And there are two books that have recently been written which talk about this. One of them is by Richard Francis, um, and one of them is by Peter Godfrey Smith. I'm not going to give you the titles uh, because, uh, well, the Godfrey, the Godfrey Smith book is a really fine book, but it has this one, I think, big lapse is that he buys Richard Francis's idea of and term adaptation is paranoia. And this is basically uh, the same line that, that uh, Gould and Lewinton uh, uh, championed 30 years ago, uh, uh, which uh, shakes a finger at adaptationists and says that's not a good methodology. Well, no, it's a hugely successful strategy of research in biology, it can be overdone. There's such a thing as doing bad adaptationism. But if we do it right, we ask lots of why questions. And very often, we get really interesting answers which we can then use to test empirical hypotheses and make predictions. So I'm sticking by my guns and recommending that when we reverse engineer religion, the same as when we reverse engineer birds or trees, uh, that we uh, look for the reasons why the parts are the way they are, and very often we're going to find that there's very interesting reasons indeed. And applied to cultural designs, it's actually the antidote to paranoia. We've had hundreds of years of social historians and critics and theorists looking at human culture, and particularly at religion, and seeing, like Paley, seeing all the design, all the cunning in the institutions. And they're because they're not used to evolutionary thinking, they think they've got to postulate a clever designer. This is the, these are the clever, the clever priest, the evil priest, uh, uh, the mastermind priest theory of how religions get established. No, we don't need masterminds at all. Just like beetles, or for that matter, palm trees, religions can benefit from adaptations that neither they nor anything else understands. The understanding comes later in the analysis, not before in the process of creation. Now, if we want to extinguish religion or encourage it to mutate into benign forms, 
we need to understand how it works and why. Thanks for your attention. I never listen to a talk by Dan Dennett without my mind racing and exulting in the, the sheer joy of intellectual exercise. It's been a fabulous talk. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. I'm afraid we, we have overrun time rather severely. Um, Dan has uh, said that he will try to discover the missing... Uh, the missing link, yes. Yes, yes. And uh, so we'll, we'll leave it to that. So thank you, Dan, very much. Okay.